you know, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're going to occasionally do something that other people think is weird. Right? And it's going to seem like odd timing or a little out of order. But, you know, the Spirit of God disrupts our normal life. And, you know, not only sometimes allows things that are difficult for us, but often uh, will come into difficult things and do something really beautiful. And so uh, we can't, can't put God in a box. And uh, I was really touched when uh, Brother Ben went up there and started praying. And I was thinking about how, you know, if my sister or my daughter was 14 weeks pregnant and having some mysterious, you know, blood problem, I'd probably be pretty shaken by that. And so why don't we just as a family pray for them real quick again, double down on that if that's okay. And then we'll get in our Bible study and just see if the Lord might want to speak to us all about something else. So, um, Lord, thank, thank you so much for uh, Ben's uh, obedience to your spirit and just humility to bow before you regardless of who else is in the room. I love that so much. And I just lift up Carly to you. And I don't know if I've ever met Carly, but you know her intimately. You knew her before you knit her together in her mother's womb. As you've known all of us since before we were born. And you've called us to a life of faith. And um, Lord, even in troubling, troubling times, you call us to cling to you, to cry out to you, to point to you, to proclaim you. And so that's my prayer for Carly, is that her eyes would be on you right now. And that you as the great physician would just touch her. Just touch her abdomen. Um, touch her where healing needs to be administered, Lord, that you would fix whatever is broken in that precious body and that you would keep that baby to term and that there'd be a, a healthy little boy or little girl and that this church would just be overwhelmed with rejoicing and that the relief of Ben as just a, a dad who just loves his wife and loves his kids would just be a testimony to many people. That a lot of people would come to know you and believe in you because of this. So Lord, we're just laying it out. We're just asking you by faith to bring, you know, what the world would call a miracle, but we, what we know is just your breath into a specific situation. Breathe into this. Give us that Holy Spirit indescribable grace. We call down for your mercy right now on Carly's body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, you know, I, Debbie's not in here, right? Good, I can talk about her. Um, I'm really grateful for the Nyhoffs. I, I got to meet all of you guys, you know, because of them and their hospitality. I'm not sure if Ron ever told you guys this story, um, but I was preaching at a church in Pennsylvania, and I had been given a grant as a missions organization. Our foundation had been given a pretty large sum of money by a ministry that was kind of dying up on the East Coast in a place where there were evangelicals were just disappearing. You know, the, the synagogue was full and the Catholic Church was full, but man, all the good Bible preaching churches up there just seemed to be dying left and right in the Albany area. And they gave us this grant to start like a training center to train missionaries to plant churches in that area. And I was really excited about sending people up there, but I didn't want to go myself. And I kept bringing young couples up to Albany and saying, I'd like to be the people that, you know, will fully fund you to train missionaries. You can use our program. I'll come back and forth and help. Every guy said yes, and every wife said no. So none of them moved up there. And so I decided that I would go scout the area and look for a farm or someplace that I would be comfortable training people and just move up there myself. And one of my Indian missionaries, a guy that runs our school that trains church planters, very similar to this East Coast project, in New Delhi, India, Dr. John was doing like a fundraising round to the East Coast, and he met this church up near Quakertown, Pennsylvania, and one of the ladies in that church had a farm for sale, and it had a pond with fish, and you know, it was being fed by a stream, and so it was really beautiful, and the price was really good, so I flew up there to Philly, I think, and then rented a car, drove up to Quakertown, and turned off the road, went deep into the country, and found this gorgeous farm. And they invited me to stay there. They had like a guest house and then a rental house, like, a, like two or three apartments, like a duplex, and, and this gorgeous farm. And um, the lady who had some sort of like prayer and counseling ministry, very like charismatic, uh, sweet lady. And I think she's about 100 years old, real articulate and just a genius, like a doctor, a PhD type person. And she asked if it would be okay with me for her pastor to come and meet me to kind of interview me to see if I was really a good dude. 
And I was like, sure. I was like, first of all, I'm not that great of a guy, but I am saved. Uh, but sometimes I feel like I'm barely saved. And so, uh, like, if this is some kind of character test, I'm, I might fail it. You know, like, I'm just, you know, I'm not that, uh, I'm not a real holy roller, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I was like, all right, let's do it. So the guy comes out, we have some sandwiches, and we talk for like an hour, and we really hit it off. And he invited me to preach at his church the next day. And so I was really excited about that. And so I got up to preach at this at a little charismatic church outside of Quakerville, Quaker Land, Quaker Town, whatever it was, Pennsylvania. And about five minutes into the message, I look over and I notice that the pastor and his wife, their head is down, and they're shaking their head like this, and they did not like anything I was saying at all. And after about five more minutes of that, I was feeling a little bit uncomfortable. So just sort of to make a joke, I said, well, I'm never going to get invited back to this church to preach, so I may as well let you have it. And then I preached a pretty hard sermon on our calling to live out our faith in action as missionaries, not just to be like an audience member who applauds the speaker every week and gets up and sings some songs and throws a 20 or a 10 or a 5 or whatever your barrier is financially into the offering bucket. It was somewhat confrontational, and uh, at the end of the sermon, I said, I'm going to pray really hard and heavy over you guys, that God will stir you up and cause you to repent. And uh, I was like, you don't need a class on evangelism. What you need to do is, is repent and like be bold in your faith. And just, I don't care if it's the barista at Starbucks or the lady that cut your hair or, or the mailman or a neighbor or a stranger. I don't care, but share the gospel with someone. And if you're just such a chicken little that you can't just tell your testimony about how you got saved to someone else, okay, then at least invite them to church to meet someone else that will share. I mean, do something for Jesus this week. I, I, I probably went overboard. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I was frustrated because these people were shaking their head at me and they were clearly the leaders and I'm... Um, not only did they not plan to invite me back, like they didn't even say goodbye to me. When I got up to leave, they like walked into the office to hide from me. It was really awkward. So I'm out in the parking lot, and all these young people, like young adults, kind of run out of the church and want to talk to me and hug me. And like they, the people liked me, but the leaders did not want their people exposed to this you know, really harsh and hard message. And so it was kind of mixed feelings. Right? I'm hugging these young people, and they're like, pray for me. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And so I'm about to get in my little rental car, and I hear this old gravelly voice. <laughs> Sound like a bear behind me. He's like, young bear, how are you? I turn around, and it's like Grizzly Adams, right? He's got a beard down to ZZ Top level, you know? And I'm like, oh, I didn't see him in the church. I mean, he really stood out. He's like, oh, did you say that you never turned down an offer to preach? I'm like, I have never once in my life turned down an offer to preach the gospel anywhere in the world. And he said, all right, my church in Tennessee would love to have you. And he goes, I guarantee you we'll ask you back because I'm one of the elders. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'll do it. And it took about six months for me to, I lived in San Diego at the time. And I was coming back and forth to Nashville quite a bit. And so I flew out here and rented a car. And I stayed at the little happy cabin up there off the lake and, or the river, happy mountain cabin. Oh, such a cool place. And I came here and preached, and I was really nervous because I thought, I don't want to be fake. I mean, I don't want to talk you into asking me to come back. I want to be who I really am, and then let's just see if he was right. So anyway, I've been here about six or seven times now, and evidently nobody hates me, and every time I come here, people jam biscuits in my face and hug me, and I feel really loved here. Well, I wanted to share all that because, you know, the truth is, not every group of Christians is a solid fit for every type of leadership or set of gifts or temperament. Do you guys know what the term bellicose means? Have you ever heard the term bellicose? Bellicose, or bellicosity, if you're a real literary person. Bellicose is a description of a person who was born for combat. A person that loves war. You think of Thor. You know how Thor has that hammer and he loves to go pick a fight and start a fight and end a fight. And even when he gets beat up by the Hulk, he seemed to enjoy it. That's bellicose, right? You guys saw that movie? Was... <laughs> okay, so, so as a bellicose, sort of clumsy, socially awkward, charismatic, Baptist reform person, I just feel like I was designed to offend people. I don't know. I just, it's not just that I tell the truth. I just do it in a way where a lot of people don't like the way I talk. And, 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 and yet, you know, in the last year, since you guys have been sponsoring uh, us as missionaries, we've helped start four churches locally. We've been involved in several things overseas, but I think we'll have to talk more about that on Judgment Day because I can't always say I know for sure those people are telling me the truth about what they're doing with our money. But it seems like there's some multiplication of churches happening overseas in a couple different countries. 
that you guys have invested in. I know for sure you guys helped me buy a motorcycle for a guy that's out planting churches in Uganda. So I mean, there's some cool stuff happening overseas, but just right here, since I moved back to Tennessee a year ago, we've started four churches. I've mentored several army officers and non-commissioned officers on how to live like missionaries. Several of them have really adopted this, this lifestyle of going into the harvest on a regular basis and discipling people that will lead to Christ. I've led four people to Christ myself. My team has led several people to Christ. And we've had several baptisms, only one that I would consider like my baptism. Although my back hurt that day, so I asked another guy to do it because my back hurt. And so, uh, you know, it's been a pretty fruitful year. Not the best year of ministry I've ever had. Um, you know, I'm newly married. I've been married. I just had my second anniversary. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to brag, but I do want you guys to know, especially you guys, because I know you like music. Just completed an album. And it's mostly Christian songs, like worship songs. There's four country songs on it because I am a redneck. But if you want the album, it's free. You go to YouTube and type in Tent Maker Collective. Three separate words. Tent Maker Collective. It's ten songs. I wrote nine of them. One of them I stole from James Taylor. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, it's been a cool year, right? And I, I want to say thank you to the church, but especially to, um, you know, Ron and Debbie for their intense, amazing hospitality to me. They've, they have literally provided a refuge for me. Like, right? There was a time in my life when I was going through probably the hardest time of my life, actually. And I went out and just hid in their little cabin for a couple weeks just to be away from everybody, just to sort of be alone with God and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I'll be honest with you, I thought I was going to just go back into business. And I felt very clearly that God was like, mm -mm, I'm not done with your calling yet. I did not repent of your calling because of what someone else has done. With that being said, Ron called me when he got back. Yeah. He said, I got this guy that I want to come preach. Can we? I said, well, tell me about it. He said, he really is reaching out. I said, bring him up. <laughs> so, and, and this has been six or seven times. Yeah, man. That's maybe even more. It's a miracle because, I, I, like, if I've preached at 100 it's churches. If I've preached at 100 churches, I guarantee 12 of them haven't had me back a second time. And the reason is, I just call a spade a spade. Listen, if I preach to you a thousand times and you never do anything different, you don't repent, you don't grow, you don't whatever, oh, yeah, that's not my fault. Ezekiel says, if someone is coming to attack your town and you know about it, your job is to warn the town. And if you do, then there's no blood on your hands. But if you keep that knowledge to yourself and the town gets attacked and people get hurt and injured and killed, then their blood is on your hands. Well, you say what you want about me, but I ain't got no blood on my hands because I tell everybody everywhere that if you are a born-again believer and the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and you have access to the Word of God, there's literally no excuse for you to not be fruitful. I mean, Jesus made it super clear. He said, what brings my Father glory is that you bear much fruit. Right? So have you decided to bring God glory and bear much fruit? Now look, some of you may be like, I ain't never going to share the gospel with someone. Great. You know what you could do that would change the world? You could pray for crazy people like me. I mean, I know for a fact that most of the people I've led to Christ is probably because someone else was praying harder than I was preaching. All right, when we get to heaven, we're going to be blown away by the fruit that intercessory prayer warriors have had. And, and maybe you're not a prayer warrior and you're not bold and don't want to go out and shake and bake with us. But maybe you'll you know, buy the airplane ticket for me and some guys to go to the Middle East to do this. There's so many different ways that you can participate in the kingdom of God and bear fruit. So I'm not trying to shame anyone, right? I'm not trying to like, make anyone feel bad. I'm just saying, you know, come on. And, and the Apostle Paul said, you can follow me, listen to this, very key, as I follow Christ. Right? So I probably ate too much bacon at breakfast today. I'm just going to admit to you, like I knew, my body and my spirit were both saying, don't eat no more bacon, chubby. And I went ahead and had like two more pieces. And so I can just confess to you that I crossed over into the sin of gluttony right before I came here to preach to you. What a hypocrite. Right? And I know it's true. So I wouldn't say follow me to a buffet restaurant. Do not eat like I eat. Right? But I would definitely say believe what I believe and minister the way I minister. Because it's just simple and straightforward. And so I'm not trying to shame or guilt anyone into doing anything. But I feel like the church needs a pretty constant call from apostolic people, evangelistic people, and prophetic people. And an apostolic person is someone that starts new ministries. An evangelist 
isn't someone that should do all the evangelism. He's the person that's supposed to equip the whole church to do their version of evangelism. And then a prophetic person isn't someone that can fortune tell and tell you exactly what's going to happen in your future, but someone that can apply the Word of God in a very pragmatic way to people. And someone that makes sure other people that are teaching and preaching are applying God's Word in a very faithful way. So today I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I once described myself as a not very loving pastor. I, I actually did pastor a church for about 19 years. I, and I didn't feel like I was very good at it because I didn't feel a lot of affection for people. I'm not a tender man. I'm actually not super compassionate. And so I told my congregation, this is a church that I planted, the second church I started, I told them, there were probably you know, 120, 130 people in there that day. I said, look, if you're in the hospital and I show up, you're probably gonna die. Because I'm not coming to the hospital to cuddle you with your ingrown toenail or your appendix scar. Like, I, I got other stuff I'm working on. Bigger, bigger stuff. But if you're in the hospital bed and I show up, someone told me you were going to die. So I'm going to come and read Psalms over you. And, okay, a couple of weeks later, someone that I really did care about and had a lot of actual connection to was in the hospital. And when I showed up, they weren't scared, but a couple of other people from the church were, like, very confused, you know. And I was like, take it easy. They're the exception to the rule. 1 John chapter 4, um, from a guy who has been extremely confused about how loving God is. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I'm baffled by this. I consider the gospel kind of a scandal. <laughs> like, like, I know what I deserve. Right? When I hear people demand justice, you know, all these protesters out there say, we want justice. I always think, God, I don't want justice. I would hate justice. Do you know what justice would mean for me? That would mean I would get what I deserve. Let me tell you, I don't know about you, but I don't want what I deserve. I cry out for mercy. Right? You can have all the justice you want. I'm begging for mercy. Because I've done awful things to myself and to other people, and especially to God's reputation, by just making tons of selfish and stupid choices. And so I'm constantly having to... to tack back. You ever seen a sailboat? It never goes in a straight line. And so if you're kind of sailing into the wind, they call it tacking. You're just bouncing left and right, left and right to kind of eventually get where you're going. And my whole walk with Christ has felt like that. Wrong turn. Wrong turn. Overreact. Overreact. Someone has to come to my life and be like, hey dude, calm down. I'm like, you're right. Let's pray. But I'm constantly fighting a war between the new man right, and the old man. And the old man sometimes feels like he's kicking the new man's rear end in a, in, a, in a wrestling match, and it's just sad. And then I look at this, and I'm so excited to see the overarching theme of God's love and where I fit under this. And so let's just, I'm just going to read through it. It's 1 John chapter 4, just a few verses, 7 through 10. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God has sent His one and only Son into this world so that we may live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let me pray for you, and I'm just going to break this down into a couple of little bite-sized pieces. Father, would you speak to us through your Word and, and let anything that's just from me or anecdotal slide away, but any point that you would make to your people today that is truly of eternal value, would you uh, hammer it into our hearts? And bury this into our conscience and call us to be more like Christ. And Lord, would you help us to yield to your spirit and truly follow you? In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about, you know that Tina Turner song that was real popular about 20 years ago? What's love got to do? Got to, have you heard this song? Got to do with it? I love Tina Turner. And what's love but a 
Secondhand emotion. And I was just thinking about that song as I was reading through this, and I thought, it'd be so corny to sing a Tina Turner song. Eh, so what? So the reason I was thinking about it was because almost everyone that I deal with, even most Christians, still seem to be under this sort of misunderstanding that love is primarily about how we feel. But I would contend with that. If I were a lawyer making a case and you were the jury today, I would demand that you look at scriptural evidence that denies the fact that love is primarily a feeling. Of course it has to do with our feelings, right? When I say I love lasagna, that's just a feeling I get when I smell the pasta and the meat sauce and the cheese baking, right? But mostly when the Bible refers to a love relationship, whether it's describing our relationship to one another or describing God's relationship with us, he's primarily talking about the idea of a commitment, a prioritized commitment. I used to always think about how if a, if a husband came home and said, Honey, I love you so much. I really do. I just love you so much. And this other girl I love, I don't love her as much as I love you. Would that wife be okay with that? <laughs> no way. There'd be murder in the house. I mean, it'd be, it'd be mayhem for sure. It'd be a bad, bad scene. Right? And so every wife in the world knows that they want to be their husband's one and only love. I think that's pretty fair. You know, that's, a, that's a legit expectation, I'd say. So God has called us to love each other and to love Him with some commitment and some focus. And so He gives us this little nugget of Scripture, and I want to kind of go through it to talk about not so much the difference between feelings and commitment, but to highlight some of the, the attitudes and ideas that I think God wants us to understand when it comes to how His love lives through us. So let me just read verse 7 by itself. Beloved, let us, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God, fathered of God, adopted by God, and knows God. So true love is more than a feeling. Um, God's love compels us. Do you know what the word compel means? You guys know that story where the king wants to have a feast, and he sends his servants out to invite his friends to the big party, and they all say no? One of them says, I've got a crop I have to dig out of the field. One of them says, I'm going to a funeral. One of them has some other lame excuse. And the king is not, like, happy, by the way. <laughs> You'd think if he was some benevolent king, he'd just be like, yeah, well, no big deal. He's mad. He's mad at the people that said no. He's mad at the people that didn't get the job done. And he's got all this money laid out in food and decorations. He's probably got a band hired. You know, and he's like, I want someone to come to my party. So he tells his servants, get out there. And find some people to come to my party and make it happen. I can think of my football coach and telling us, shake and bake, right? Just get it done. So they go out and they find people and bring them to the party. And the idea of this story is that when they went out and just casually invited people, nothing happened. But when those same servants went out and compelled people to the feast of the king, their ability to compel people was shown as a spiritual value. It was a good thing, right? And so a lot of people resist being compelled, right? Nobody wants to be told what to do. But when your king says, come on over, shouldn't you just go, right? And so Jesus is constantly saying, look, I love you and I want to spend some time with you. I love you and I want you to be my ambassador. I love you <laughs> and I want you to really know what my word says about things. You know, you know how you know you're walking with the Lord? When a problem comes up in your life and your first thought is scripture. If it's not, that's okay. Don't feel embarrassed or ashamed. But when the Bible says to hide His Word in your heart, right? That, that's, that's what it's talking about. is to know it so well, the whole counsel of God, that when someone else comes to you with a problem, your first thought isn't Dr. Phil. It was Dr. Jesus. And what would He say? What would Jesus say into this problem? And so God's love is compelling. And God's love completes us. Right? We're born very broken. We're broken people born into a broken world. Right? And if you're not from a broken family, I'd say you're the exception to the rule nowadays. Right? Praise God if you're from a whole family. That's an amazing testimony nowadays. 
I do weddings for people and almost never, I mean, maybe like two out of 35 of the last weddings I've done was the bride and groom, both from families whose original parents were still married. It's just super rare nowadays. So if you have that story, that is an amazing minority testimony. Praise God for your parents and their faithfulness. But God completes us because when he calls us into his family, he becomes that for us. He becomes our rock. He becomes our steady force. He becomes that which we can count on. He who we can depend on. And God wants to be that father to all of us. But I'll tell you something I think is really interesting. He wants to be our daddy, but he also wants to be our bridegroom. Isn't that interesting? I had a, a friend back in San Diego. He was a real smart, theological, Ph.D. type guy. And he kind of made me mad. He was invited by the NIV publishing group, forget the name of that company, to retranslate the NIV and make it like hipper, cooler, more modern than like the one made in the 80s. And so what he did was he took out all the things that talked about our gender roles in Scripture. In other words, in the Bible where it literally says in Greek that, you know, by faith you become the sons of God, he made it the children of God. Right? Sort of like a I don't know what you'd call that. Dual gender roles. He took the masculinity out of a lot of phrases in the Bible. And I'm not some like ogre about translation, right? I'm a, I'm a fairly cool guy. But what I told him and why I thought it was a mistake was that in the date of the writing of the New Testament, daughters didn't inherit anything from their parents. Right? If there was any sons, if a, if a guy had 16 daughters and one son, that son got the inheritance. I don't like that. That's not who I am. I'm kind of a liberal hippie when it comes to stuff like boys and girls being equal. But I just know in the Bible times, that's just how it was. And so when the Bible says that we are sons of God, right, I just hope it doesn't offend you because what it means is you're a co-inheritor with Christ. That, that there is no male or female in our kingdom. No Jew, no Gentile, right? No Greek, no barbarian. That in Christ we're equal. We're equally needy. We're equally redeemed and we're equally satisfied. The Spirit has equally filled each of us and that we are all co-inheritors with Christ. I want, you to under, I want you to embrace being the sons of God, ladies. And to be fair, guys, you know what we have to embrace? We're the bride of Christ. <laughs> and he didn't take that out. I'm like, come on, Dr. S. I don't want to say his name, but you can look at the new NIV and see who translated the New Testament. I just think he's a goofball. He's a great preacher, and he loves Jesus. I just thought that was dumb. Well, he, he compels us, he completes us, and he comforts us. It's real interesting that that guy, um, Ben, I want you guys to definitely call him if you're friends with him and, and tell him you're going to keep praying for him this week. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, if, if you can, it might be really worth going over to visit him and Carly and just laying hands. You know, James chapter 5 says, let's lay hands, yeah. Awesome. I mean, he seems like a really good dude. But, uh, you know, I'm not telling you what to do. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just saying if, if I lived here and this was my, you know, full-time church family, I'd be like getting some dudes together to go over and put some oil on her and pray for her. I don't even know what the oil does. I just know that's what the Bible says. And so I say, let's just roll with that, right? Do exactly what it says in James 5. So, because of God's love, we're compelled, we're completed, and we're comforted. Look, let's look at verse 8 together. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is love. It is the summation of His character. Right? I, I had a friend, uh, he now pastors the biggest church in San Diego. It's called the Rock Church. And he and I both come from like a football background. He's about 10 years older, older than me. And he's kind of a mentor to me for many years. Like I'd call him when I was having a hard time and he'd just walk me through. He's a real process oriented guy, really a smart dude. And both of us came from a druggy background and a football background, so we really hit it off. And um, probably my best ministry was a church that he and I co-sponsored. His college pastor started working at my church we kind of shared them. It was really weird. And then that guy went to Phoenix to plant a church, and we both kind of paid for a lot of that guy's expenses. And that ministry out in Phoenix is by far the biggest, like numerically, the largest ministry 
we've ever helped sponsor. Our, our largest daughter church is in Phoenix, and they have three campuses, and thousands of people have been saved. And Justin, this kid who was in his 20s and went out there to plant that church, he's now moved on to plant two other churches in San Francisco, and now he's in Seattle planting his third church. And so, but Miles and I, this guy that pastors the big church in San Diego, we really bonded over a lot of these things. And I remember once I went to hear him preach, I took my whole staff on a Sunday night. All the people that worked at my church, I took them to hear Miles because I just felt like God wanted me to. It was kind of a charismatic moment. I didn't have a real explanation, but I was like, come on, I'll buy you dinner. So I think almost everyone that worked for me at the time went to this service one night. And Miles was just being really informal and talking and whatever. I don't remember the whole gist of his sermon. But I remember once he leaned over his pulpit and he looked down. We were all kind of in the front two or three rows. And he's like, look, man, if you're not trying to be more like Christ, then why did you get saved? Now, that's not like a scripture. I can't point right to every verse that he meant to entail by that. But man, it touched my heart. And I remember later, we as a church staff at, you know, Bennigan's or Chili's or wherever we were that night, we talked about that. Like, like isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Isn't that iron sharpening iron? Encouraging one another, building each other up kind of calling each other out, holding one another accountable, interceding for one another, bearing with each other, carrying each other's burdens, considering another's problems more important than your own. I'm just quoting scripture after scripture that to me just all sort of leads to what Miles was trying to say to all of us that night, which was, you know, being called into Christ and accepting our adoption into Christ and being completed by Christ, being saved by Christ. Doesn't that sort of give him the privilege as our Lord, our Shepherd, our King, our Father, our Bridegroom, all these roles that he wants to play for us? Doesn't, doesn't his love over us sort of draw us to a point where we would say, man, I wish I could be more like him? I mean, isn't that kind of the point? I mean, you don't think that what he really wants is for us to just sing, right? He wants us to sing, but he also wants us to submit. Right? He wants to be our Lord and Savior, not just Savior. <laughs> he wants to be our King and our Daddy, our Abba Father. So anyone that does not love does not know God. Love is the best self-evaluation. Here's a, a cross-reference verse. I've always loved this. John 14, 21. Can anyone quote it? John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and obeys them is the one that loves me. So if you want to know if you love Jesus, just look at John 14, 21. This is, this is the second half. Whoever has my commandments and, and keeps them or obeys them is the one that loves me. And the one that loves me shall be loved of my Father, loved by my Father, and I too will love him and reveal myself to him. And so I used to always say to my college kids when I had a bunch of big college group, I'd say, do you want God to show up in your life? It comes through obedience. I'd be like, look, if you're at a fork in the road and there's a big, pretty, paved road, yeah, Jesus doesn't live there. And then there's this ugly little goat path that looks like you're going to twist your ankle and fall down a hill. That's where Jesus lives. So if you want to hang out with Jesus, you've got to pick the hard path. You can't have the comfort and the intimacy that Christ has called us to and take the easy way out of everything. The hard road is where Jesus lives. Does that make sense? I think he said it himself. So here's your self-evaluation based on this. How can I know if I truly love God? If you're a writer, downer, note taker, these are four things I want you to write down. Number one, ask yourself. Man, don't ask me. I don't know what's in your heart. How could I know your heart? I don't, only you and God know your heart. Your wife doesn't know your heart. Your husband doesn't know your heart. Your best friend doesn't know your heart. You know your heart, and God knows your heart. That's it. The rest of us have to trust each other. So ask yourself and ask the Lord, do you truly love his word? Do you love God's word? I mean, it's pretty yes or no. Number two, do you love God's people? Now, I'm not a real affectionate or tender person, but ask me for help and see what happens. Right? So I have a very pragmatic love for God's people. I will break my back to help another Christian. Uh, but I may not hug you a lot. You know what I mean? I may not cry at all the things you cry at, but call me and tell me you need something. So I, I do love God's people. I don't know about you. Do you love God's mission? Now, you know, that doesn't mean everyone has to be a full-time missionary. I mean, for years, I worked full-time and did missions as much as I could. They call it being a tent maker, like Paul would make tents to support his missionary habit. You know, no one has to be a full-time missionary. But, I mean, are you at least a sometime missionary? Do you love God's purpose, his mission, his calling to make sure that everyone hears the gospel? Are you part of that? 
And then four, do you love God's kingdom? My life verse is Psalm 37, 4. My favorite translation says it like this. Delight thyself in the ways of the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight yourself in the way God does things, and then he'll give you the desires of your heart. Man, I love that verse because it, it's not automatic for me. There are times when I have to ask him to help me delight in the choices he's made for me and in the way he does things. You know, Jesus calls it carrying your cross. That's the same thing. You know, because sometimes God will call you to do something, a mission, a relationship, uh, a temporary assignment, or a long-term assignment that you would not have chosen for yourself. And so do you love God's word? Do you love God's people? Do you love his mission? Do you love his kingdom? These are not questions for me to evaluate you and your walk. These are, these are self-evaluation questions. But I can tell you right now, if you don't ask yourself those questions occasionally, hey, like I said, this is between you and God. One of the reasons I am a Baptist is the priesthood of the believer. Like one of our three major doctrines, right? The scripture is true, the authority of scripture. The autonomy of the local church. We don't have any weird like Catholicism where some bishop can ride in here and tell you what to do as an elder. Right? You and the elders are elders here. You know, y'all, you and Nyhoff are the popes <laughs> of this little church. Oh, that sounded creepy, didn't it? Um, and so you've got the the autonomy of the local church, the authority of scripture, and the priesthood of the believer. Those are our three things that really make us all kind of Baptists. Priest of a believer means that when you stand before God, I mean, if I did something terrible or misled you, I can apologize forever and ever, but you can't blame me. You can't say, well, my husband or my wife or my kid or my daddy or my preacher, it's their fault. Nothing. You are going to stand before your Creator all by yourself. And so my job is to equip you for good works, to use your gifts in the church and in the world so that when you stand before God, you have something besides wood, hay, and stubble to go into the fire with. Does that make sense? Verse 9, we're halfway done. These second two will be much quicker, I promise. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. This love, God's love, is a very expensive commitment. What did God pay to reveal His love to us? To bring us into His love? He paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Though my sin left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow. Three things I want you to see that, that God did in purchasing us. The first is obviously just redemption. You know, when you redeem a coupon, <laughs> if someone gives you a gift card and you take it in, that's a redemption. You're taking that Chili's card and you're buying some, some nachos and some egg rolls and a steak burger or whatever at Chili's. That's, you're trading one thing for another. That's redemption. And when the Bible says that He redeemed us, He purchased us back from our rightful owner, which was sin and the world. Our flesh was our master. And all of us were in bondage in chains. Like slaves in, you know, in a ship being transported from one continent to another. All of us were born into sin and slavery to that sin. And then because of the incredible love of God and His death on a cross, that His blood was shed like a currency to pay back what we dutifully owed for our sins. He redeemed us. He purchased us. Now this is the part Americans don't want to hear, but I'm going to tell you anyway. American Christians, that means He owns us. Right? And no longer are we slaves to sin. Now, it's so amazing. God, I love Jesus. Let me tell you what He says. I no longer call you servants, but now I call you friends. Because the servant knows not, know, doesn't know what the master is up to. But I tell you guys everything. I mean, like, He could just treat us like slaves. But He doesn't. He calls us to His table. He brings us into His family. He literally paid for us. And then, instead of treating us like slaves and keeping us out of the house, He made us co-inheritors, literally sons with Christ. Christ is the first among all the children of God. The second aspect of the expense of His love is justification. Justification is just a legal term. When the gavel comes down and the judge proclaims someone innocent or guilty, it's too late to come in and be like, wait, 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 I've got more evidence against this guy. Well, the gavel went down. 
<laughs> case is over. You ever heard of double jeopardy? Like once you've been acquitted of murder, you could go out on the steps of the courthouse and go, let me show you some pictures of when I did it, and they can't put you in jail for it. You can't be tried twice for the same crime. And so the second that you're proclaimed innocent by God, even though intellectually we know that we're not innocent because we feel the feelings and the consequences of our stupidity and our sin, even though we know we're jacked up, God says, I proclaim you innocent. He imputes the very righteousness of Jesus into our life. And then he imputed our sin onto the very back and shoulders of Jesus that he would carry that for us. He's a perpetuation. It's an incredible idea. That this double imputation. It's the least fair thing that's ever happened in the universe. It is literally a scandal. It's scandalous that we as guilty people go free when he paid that price for us. But then the judge who sees that our incredible lawyer not only defended us and paid the whole bill for the price of the defense, but then literally took the currency of his blood and paid for the guilt and the consequences of our sin eternally, the judge, in, I think in a great passionate voice, says, you are innocent because all of your guilt has been given and paid in full to tell us die. What a deal. The third thing that you know, I'll point out about his incredibly uh, expensive love, redemption and justification, and then just a reminder, I've already kind of covered that we're adopted. You know, adoption isn't free, right? Anyone here ever been part of an adoption? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Well, whoever adopted you paid some money for that, let me tell you. Yeah. I don't know if they liked you later in life, but when they were looking at you as a baby, they were like, we want that kid and we're willing to pay. Kill an even better story. Praise God. You know, a lot of older kids never get adopted. And so someone chose you and then went and paid all those fees. And I, mean, I don't know. I've heard people say they've paid up to ten or twenty thousand dollars to adopt someone. That's incredible. I mean, I, that's amazing. I was a foster son for a few years, and I was in, I was blown away by their incredible Christian love. Um, yeah, that make you reformed, won't it? His love is very expensive. He paid for the adoption, he paid for the justification, and he paid for the redemption. All things that we need to be part of the family of God. Last verse, verse 10. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He loved us first. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. His love was entirely his initiation. I love it when people talk about how they chased after God, when the Bible literally says the opposite. <laughs> I mean, you can argue with the Bible all day long. You can argue with me. And as long as I'm holding up a scripture and you're arguing with that, I feel like I'm in a pretty safe place. Because the Bible is super clear that no one comes to the Father unless he is what? Drawn by the Spirit. I can tell you this, when I started to believe intellectually that Jesus was who he claimed to be, I did not become a Christian right away. As a matter of fact, it started to freak me out because I did not like you people. So I was raised in a pagan household, and I was raised to mock people of faith. And so when all of a sudden those two worlds sort of collided, because of my foster parents, those nosy people praying for me all the time and preaching the gospel over and over and praying for me more and revealing true love like I'd never seen before. I mean, it just got so gross that at some point I'm like, okay, okay, okay. What do you want me to do? My foster dad's name is Fred. I just, <laughs> the hero of my world. He said, you know what I want you to do, senor? I want you to go into your closet and shut the door. And when you shut the door, you're standing there in your dark closet. What I want you to do is I want you to say, God, I don't believe in you, but if you're there, I'll take some evidence. This guy was brilliant. I had no idea that was actually in the Bible. If I read that later, I'm like, oh, Fred, you tricky old goat. I went in my closet because this guy that loved me, before I could possibly ever love him back, I shut the door to my closet. I said, all right, I don't believe in you, but if you're there, I'll take some evidence. And within about a month, I knew God was real. And a week later, I knew Jesus was real and died on the cross, but I still didn't want to be a Christian. You know why? Because you people don't fight enough. You don't get drunk to solve your problems. I mean, I guess some of you do, but you're not supposed to. 
It's taboo. <laughs> you know? You had all these standards of like purity and holiness. You didn't talk the way I wanted to talk. Christians just didn't behave well in my mind. I especially didn't like the part where you're not allowed to just go punch a guy in the face if he's making you mad. I just thought that was dumb. But about a week after that, so about two months after the praying in the closet thing, when I believed in God, then I believed in Jesus, and then I wrestled with being a Christian, one day I realized, if anyone on this planet deserves to go to hell, it's me. I'll be honest with you, I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> and I knew that what I deserved was not what I wanted. His love was entirely His and nation. Our choice is mostly to do with timing and frequency. When will you abide and how often will you abide? When will you do charity? And how often will you do charity? And when will you do outreach? And how often will you proclaim the good news to your neighbors as lost as they are? Can I pray for you? Lord, we're so grateful for your word, and we just pray that as we study together and pray together and sing together, that you just do the things in our hearts that only you can do to change us to be more like Christ. Help us to be more loving as individuals, as families, as, and as a community. And Lord, I pray a special blessing on all the churches up in Clarksville and our new church that meets in a bar in Mount Juliet. I'm so excited about that church in the bar. So just bless those people. Lord, bless my wife as I travel and just keep her safe. And um, Lord, bless my children and all of our children as some of them have wandered away. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And God's children said, Amen. Amen.